How you guys doing? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I know it's Friday morning, and for a lot of you, this is your first day of the con. But like, I had people in the in the room working on the crypto puzzle stuff last night till about four o'clock this morning. So bear with me. Um, you'll notice that uh, I have a liaison for DT here with me. Um, her claim to fame will be that uh, she spoke at DEFCON before she was one. She does have a goon badge, though. So anyway, her hacker handle is Supernova. So if mom could come in and, and take her. I'm mic'd up, so. So thank you guys all for coming out. Um, how many of you, by show of hands, this is your first DEF CON? Raise your hand, big. Man, every single year, it's like a huge amount. My only guesstimation is, is that uh, you only go to opening ceremonies one year, uh, unless you want to hear about the badges. Um, so normally we do a... Uh, an what? It's pinned onto my shirt. How am I going to... Eh. Come on. <laughs> And I don't mean to be offensive, by the way. Hello? Better? Yeah. Are you guys in the back? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So we're going to do something that we do every year. We do a little intro video. But first of all, you guys are still way too quiet. This is opening ceremonies for DEF CON. How is everybody? Yeah. What? <laughs> again. This must be some kind of prophetic truth. Master coincidence, certainly, but couldn't be. No, these were not imagined patterns. The mind seeking to connect accidental dots with blurred lines. This was something real. Was something elegant in its simplicity, yet dangerous in its enigmatic complexity. Undeniable in all its obscure perfection. Would everyone else be so blind? Or were there others who observed this covert conspicuousness? Able to untangle this perplexity, understood this cipher that surrounds this key, this 23. I would like to officially welcome everybody to DEF CON 23. Hey, look, you showed up. Everybody say hi, Russ. So Russ is a chief of operations at DEF CON. You want to say hi? Hi. Hi. Have a good time while you're here. If you need anything, ask a red shirt. Uh, Lost is amazing. He's not going to tell you even 20% of what he's done for this conference this year. Find all the secrets, uncover all the challenges, make it happen. Have a fantastic time and please be safe. One thing I will tell you, this is Vegas. Keep your wallets and your phones in your front pockets. Don't leave your bags laying around. We've already had a couple people that have had incidents in other places in the hotel. Don't make yourself a victim. Be smart, okay? If you need anything, Holler, otherwise let's have a great time and uh, thank you, Lost, for everything you do. Alright, so like I said, bear with me. It's uh, Friday morning, but it feels like uh, Sunday after con if you, any of you have been here. Again, so a lot of you, this is your first F con. How many of you came here not knowing what the hell to expect? Raise your hand, be honest. How many of you had a pretty good idea what you were getting yourselves into? How many of you are like, I'm just here to like party and drink and hang out? <laughs> oh, and so I did that. How many of you came to my one-on-one -on -one talk yesterday, just out of curiosity? Okay, so I apologize. There's a few real quick things that I'm going to reiterate for the other folks here. First of all, I do this every time uh, from another conference that I attend. We do a thing called a human search engine. So I'd like to just help some folks out. How many of you guys in the audience are students? Raise your hands. 
How many of you are in high school? College? How many are freshly out of college and looking for work? How many are not freshly out of college and looking for work here at DuckCon? Okay, so hold on. Every, now, how many of you out there are here to hire somebody? Okay, so I'll do that one more time. How many of you are here looking for a job? Raise your hand. How many of you are here trying to hire somebody? Now you guys talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. So, my name's Ryan. Uh, I go by 1057. Yes, it is a palindrome and binary. To write it out. It was also the solution to the first mystery challenge. So, in opening ceremonies, we just kind of like to welcome you, kind of set the tone for the conference. Um, primarily, I discuss what went into going on with the creation of the, the puzzle challenge and the badges, uh, as well as I try and direct my talks towards what you guys want to hear about. Um, most of the time, though, I get asked questions over and over about the badges, so uh, why we did what we did, um, why the design is like it is, et cetera, et cetera. So without uh, further ado, let's get going. How many of you recognize that picture? Yeah. yeah so that's uh, from a movie, uh, This Island Earth, that was riffed by the MST3K guys. And that wonderful contraption you see in front of you is called what? That's the Interocitor. Okay, so in that, in that, in that sci-fi movie, these uh, aliens sent the scientists all these parts in a manual that was hard to decipher. And they had to assemble this machine and the, not knowing what the purpose of the machine was. And at the end, of the re, at the end result was they built this machine and they could communicate with these, uh, with these aliens. But it was kind of like a test, much like uh, Last Starfighter type thing. So I kind of look at the puzzle and crypto challenges that I'm doing this year as, as kind of a test. And anyone that actually is competing will discover how true that really is because there is a side tangent that will happen in the crypto puzzle challenge this year that I've never done before. So. I made this point yesterday, I'm going to make it again. And, and this, this terrified me, I'm not going to lie. When I asked this question in the one-on-one -on -one session yesterday, and only like a few people raised their hand, it freaked me out. How many of you in the audience know what Waysonar is? When I say that, when I refer to that, with what's going on right now, how many are concerned about that? Now, every person in this room, if you are involved with security or security research, should have raised your hand. So it is a very tongue-in-cheek poke at the fact that I am very concerned about things. Uh, you saw my beautiful daughter that was up here. I want her to grow up in a world where she is free to explore and to tinker and not go to jail if she decides that her career path is to be a security researcher. I don't want her to go to jail for trying to make systems better. I don't want her to have to deal with trying to deal with back doors and crypto systems, which is, first of all, uh, if there's any bureau folks in the audience, it's not going to happen. Get over it. It's not, because people just move offshore. The companies aren't going to do it. People aren't going to put up with that. But anyway, am I not talking loud enough? I'm going to go hard. So someone in the back says they can't hear me. Can you guys in the back row hear me? Yeah, they say yes, so go screw yourself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the big joke, haha, -ha, you've all come to DEF CON this year, and congratulations, you now all have a record. Uh, you can throw the tomatoes now. But you should care about wasting art. And if I mention that and you don't know what I'm talking about, I would suggest that after you go home, maybe not here, start Googling it, look it up, be concerned, become active. That's why we're here. The people in this community are the only ones that are going to be able to, to have a voice to fix this. So, how many of you came to that on expecting an electronic badge? How many of you are familiar with our every other year policy? Okay. So those that came expecting an electronic badge, we only do that every other year. And the reason for that is back when Joe first started doing the electronic badges, um, it was kind of a new thing. Now, every freaking conference on the face of the planet has an electronic badge. And we try and keep it changed up. And by the way, it really forces you to think uh, creatively to come up with solutions to a problem. People that wouldn't want to win yesterday, that was a little joke for you. Um, so we do a non-electronic badge every other year. And I actually have more people tell me as far as the cryptographic puzzles and everything else that they actually enjoy it more. And for those who have never worn a circuit board on their shirt that hasn't been fabricated properly, I've had a number of people this year say, yes, they're large, they're seven inches, they're not the largest badge we've ever had, and as a non-electronic badge, they don't mess up your t-shirt because you're not rubbing cut traces on the back of your stomach uh, all day. But anyway, I've also heard a number of comments, oh, we don't know how to hook it to lanyards. Come on, people, it's a hacker conference, and you're complaining that you don't know how to adapt? It's, remember, we're building, we're building our interocitor here. So that, those are all of the record badges that were produced this year. Um, when they were shipped here to the hotel, 
the pallets weighed over two tons because of the amount of vinyl that was involved in these. These are actually vinyl. Um, the, the, it took hunting fabrication houses to find somebody that could do an order large enough to produce this much vinyl because nobody's doing vinyl anymore. And by the way, you can notice that the younger people in the audience will be holding these like this, and the older people in the audience will be holding them like this or like this. And so you can kind of gauge uh, people's age uh, by, by how they're holding this. And by the way, um, if anyone uh, has not yet had a chance to hear them, we're going to put record players at uh, the info booth. There'll be some in my room uh, with the USB adapter too, which you're welcome to come plug your laptop into my USB device and record, <laughs> record the audio off of these discs if you want. But I'm sure a number of people in the crypto challenge have already ripped the audio and put the files online if you have not yet heard them. I would also like to say thank you to Dual Core. Everybody give them a hand. Dualcore graciously allowed us to use uh, the Hack All the Things song, which is the B-side of your record, by the way. So off the record, uh, another question I've had already is why the small hole and not the large hole for the 45? Uh, anyone who's actually played these yet realizes that these are actually recorded, uh, etched, or pressed at a 33 speed, not 45. So they could fit more on. Cool? Everybody happy? You're all quiet. Yeah. It's Friday morning, you guys are like already tired? So, um, <laughs> anybody know the quote? Yes? No, Bucker Bonsai? Yes. So let's start talking about the Uber badge because this is the one that I'm really excited about this year. How many of you have no clue what I mean when I say Uber badge? Tell the truth. Um, yeah, maybe you've heard the term black badge. Okay, so black badge and Uber badge are the same thing. The actual official title is Uber badge. So we do this thing at DEF CON. Um, we estimate we'll have about 17,000 people this year, give or take, and we will give out roughly 15 uh, black slash Uber badges. Uh, Jeff DT makes that determination, um, and in closing ceremonies, they'll be awarded. In order to get one of these, you have to compete in a contest, and you have to win, and you have to win first place, and it has to be a contest worthy of earning one of these badges. Now, what these are are free entrance to DEF CON for the rest of your life. But what they really are is a status symbol. I know several employers that will hire somebody on the spot if they have a black badge on their resume from, from DEF CON. So the Uber badges are very special every year. And so I try and, and, and really um, go over the top with them. Um, some of you may have seen the ones that I did with the mechanical clock parts in them uh, for DEF CON 21, which was an homage to my, uh, to my grandfather. So. Um, I was talking about the waste in our thing and I was wearing this shirt, but now that I'm transitioning to talk about the Uber badges, I actually need to have a change of wardrobe here. So if you could bear with me. How many of you know who that is? Wow, a room full of really smart people and only a few clap for Feynman? That's painful. There's no back. So I've been really in, uh, in, into Richard Feynman this year. Um, I had before, but uh, really the hacker aspects of his life. Um, uh, I don't know, I haven't even realized he was a safe cracker. Um, inside of top secret facilities, he used to break into other people's safes and leave them notes or hide their files, that kind of... Can you hear? Is it fucked up? Oh, sorry, Mom. My mom actually told me to quit swearing in my talks live in front of everybody at uh, 101 yesterday. That was fun. Okay. So we start out, the base of the Uber badge this year is an acrylic that has been etched in what is called a Lichtenberg figure. Um, there's a guy named Bert Hickman who runs a website. Uh, he's a retired physicist and a uh, really awesome guy. Spent many hours on the phone with him talking about these. So the, the origin of this type of etching was dates back clear back to, the, uh, to 1777. But these were run through a 5 million volt particle accelerator because acrylic, you know, is an insulator. And it takes that to charge up the acrylic. So then the acrylic is forcibly discharged, usually taking a metal object and spiking it to ground, much akin to the way the discharge happens on the cloud when a bolt of lightning happens. 
So these are often referred to as lightning sculptures. So what you have on the base of the Uber badge this year literally is you are holding lightning in your hand, as close as a close approximation as I can get to. Um, the potentials on these when they were charged up were as high as 2.5 million volts. Um, it, it's actually really dangerous. You can see uh, the discharge uh, happening there. And the research that came out of these actually is the basis for what is now modern day plasma physics. So those are really awesome. Uh, when I was talking to Bert, uh, he said it's actually interesting that the US Air Force holds the patent on the fabrication process of these. And it, it was because during uh, unmanned test space flights, they were having instrumentation that was coming back with uh, dials that were being shattered and, and uh, had similar patterns in them. And so they studied the, the process after the fact, even though there was prior art um, back in 1777, but the, the entire process of how that happened through these space flights was actually how they came to form the patent of the actual fabrication process. So I thought that was really interesting. And um, he told me that back in uh, the 70s, there were people that were making these and giving them away, like traveling salesmen were using them as like giveaways to entice people to buy their wares. Um, but now they've kind of stopped because obviously time on a particle accelerator is not cheap and um, you have to now get permission of the U.S. Air Force to make them, I guess, if you care about patents, China. Oh, uh, wait, what? So the next thing that you will see on, on the Uber badge on the bottom, there is glass that has been doped with uranium-238. It's about 3% by weight and it fluoresces like a, a, a mother when you hit it with UV light. Um, I also took all of the adhesives that were used to attach this have been uh, doped with a phosphorus powder. So even the glue is, is um, glows when you charge it up. In fact, um, one night after I'd been working on building these, I built all of them by hand because there aren't that many Ubers. Uh, I got into bed and I rolled over. My wife looked at me and she jumped back and she freaked out and I thought somebody was breaking in the house to like murder us or something. And she said, your hair is glowing. And I. And what had happened was I had gotten this phosphorus powder on my hands when I was working on it because I I'd, um, do my hand and I had rubbed it through my hair because I was sweating and the sweat had pulled the powder off my hands and it had gotten all through my hair and apparently she said it was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> in addition to that, how many of you know what tritium is? A lot of you. How many of you have a, it's in exit signs, it's in gun sites and stuff like that. But the interesting thing is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission controls the sale of this. It determines who's allowed to purchase it, who's allowed to have it. And I actually found out that when you buy like those exit signs, you are actually getting a, uh, I forget the exact term, but it's like a temporary license to have that volume of tritium. And you have to actually theoretically dispose of it in a very particular way, which never happens. They ha you know, the exit signs wind up in landfills all the time. So, and how many of you guys from the UK? So you guys in the UK, you know you can buy these as keychains in the UK. The UK is like, we don't care, we don't give a fuck, you know. You can have all the tritium you want. So in order for me to get my hands up, well, oh, um, real quick comment. There's a guy who runs a site called depletedcranium.com and he was trying to become an importer of tritium to make keychains to make it a business. He wanted to sell them as keychains because the tritium glows for roughly 12 to 20 years depending on how much you put in it because you usually have a vial of glass, it's usually a glass vial, the tritium is a gas. And it reacts with the coating that's on the inside of that glass and it's what fluoresces. So it's like permanent glow in the dark stuff that doesn't have to be charged up. So he wanted to make keychains out of this to find your keys in the dark, that kind of thing. And he has an, an, an entire blog of his email and letter correspondence back and forth with the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And it's absolutely hilarious, the discussion that they have, because it's ridiculous about, it's like what they consider frivolous, versus uh, useful and he's like, well, finding your keys is useful and they're like, no, it's a keychain, so it's frivolous and so they're going back and forth. But anyway, if you're interested in that, go read about it, it's really funny. So we're going to have a hypothetical story here because um, I would never do this. Um, I, I heard about some guy that found a source of tritium that would ship to the United States in sealed packets of coffee. And so when things would, when things would come through, uh, customs, they would be labeled as, oh, I don't know, keychain, ironically, um, <laughs> or coffee. And you get these letters and you're thinking, hmm, I'm wondering if I have to tell Dark Tangent that I wasted some of his money because I bought tritium vials off the internet from some guy and he sent me coffee. So 
you open up the packets, there's your tritium vials. Anyway, so those in the states, apparently the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doesn't really give a rip if you have like small amounts because you have them in your gun sites and everything else, some watches. They just like to determine who does the fabrication manufacture and want to have it as a controlled substance. Ultimately, I believe, because they charge large fees for people that are getting those licenses to do it. But anyway, going on, the badges are safe. So what you're seeing there is on each Uber badge, there are two Swarovski crystal skulls, beads, and those tritium vials are embedded in those. So those of you who win an Uber this year, when you put this on your wall and you go to sleep at night, the eyes of the skull will be staring into your soul for the rest of your life. Um, for those of you, how many of you know what a banana equivalent dose is? <laughs> so for those unfamiliar, um, because everyone, def everyone keeps going, are they safe? Are they safe? Uh, don't put the badge near your nuts. You don't have kids again, you know? <laughs> so uh, there is a unit of measure that is kind of a joke amongst those that are really into nuclear physics or just screwing around with radioactive stuff um, called a banana equivalent dose. But due to the potassium that's in a banana, if you eat a banana, you get a certain amount of radiation. Uh, same thing with sleeping next to somebody, walking outside, there's background radiation. And so there are, there, the, I just found it hilarious that there is this thing called the banana equivalent dose, the BED, which is, as you can, I listed there. Um, also, um, uh, Matt Blaze was in my room uh, looking at these and he had his Geiger counter. We were trying to determine, you know, and, uh, he wanted to see independently of this stuff that I had done, you know, what the beta versus gamma versus alpha was off of these. But anyway, can you guys still hear me? Yes? No, we're dead fish. Hello? Yes? Yeah, all right. So um, there's a picture of one of the, the uranium vials. Uh, I think I have. Oh, yeah, I do have one in my pocket still. So if, if anyone wants to come look at this, it's actually, this one's actually a mix uh, of, of different ores. So the reason I show you the DRAM is in addition to the tritium vial that's on there, as well as the uranium doped glass marble, underneath one of them, there, are, there is a mixture of pitch blend, yellow cake, and uranium ore. And if you turn the badge over because the Lichtensphere is on clear acrylic, like you can see them through the back of the badge. But it's kind of like I made a little viewing window. Uh, the skull holds the radioactive material in because, you know, what better object to hold radioactive material than the skull? Um, so, uh, and that just shows, uh, so where I countersunk holes into the acrylic, put the samples in, and that, this is where I had already mounted the marbles, but I was, hadn't put the, uh, the ores in yet. So who knows what happened on July 16th, 1945? Not very many of you, right? So the reason I went through all of this trouble is I'm, I'm an avid collector of things. I like to feel connected to heroes of mine, uh, whether it be in research, mathematics, linguistics, whatever. And so Feynman has been kind of my obsession. And I was trying to think, you know, Feynman is now no longer living. So what is the closest I could be to seeing one of his experiments? And so Feynman and Oppenheimer were present on July 16, 1945, when the device, which is known as Gadget, was the first nuclear detonation. And so that happened in New Mexico. And when you do that, when you do a nuclear test like that, you form this substance called trinitite. Oops, sorry, water is almost falling. So I have also procured trinitite from the actual test site that Oppenheimer and Feynman were at. And it is also embedded on the badge underneath the skull on the other side. So theoretically, well not theoretically, literally, you are holding in your hands, one step removed, a piece of an experiment that was conducted by Feynman when you get one of these badges. That means a lot to me because I'm all about giving credit to the, gi the shoulders of giants that I try to stand on. And so this is kind of my homage yet again to, to a hero of mine. So the Trinitite um, has actually been analyzed a by a couple of different independent labs. There's also a guy online uh, named Hunter Scott who took some to Georgia Tech. And in their lab, they were able to actually not only verify the signature, but the distance from the epicenter of the blast based on the signature, um, which from these samples, I'm not releasing what it is. It's kind of like my crypto key because even if somebody managed to detonate a nuclear bomb, collect the samples, place them on a piece of Trinitite, or a, a piece of acrylic which has been charged through a particle accelerator, forcibly discharged, hold lightning, 
and go through all of that trouble and order coffee from Singapore and get tr uh, tritium vials, mount them on there, it's still not going to have the same nuclear signature as this batch. So, thank you. <laughs> So it's like an Uber RSA token, although it takes a while to verify. <laughs> so there is a final picture of the badge. Uh, there's Feynman there and Feynman here. So I wanted, I didn't want to get up here and rant and I apologize if it felt that way. I want you guys to have a great DEF CON. Um, I want you to talk to each other. I told the guys in 101, if you don't feel like someone here is approachable, then I think they're a dick and I don't want them here anyway. I think there's too many, they, yeah, thank you. Please clap for that. Don't be a dick. <laughs> we really don't want those people in the community. There's a number of people that have been getting a lot of press lately. Don't let it go to your head. They're approachable. They started just like everybody else did. And really, with what's going on on the outside, people trying to legislate research, and force backdooring and weakening of standards. That's something that needs to be taken head on and we're only going to be able to do that as if we're a unified community. I love the fact that I can come here to DEF CON and I can wear dorky t-shirts and I don't have to explain them to people. I was talking to Mickey earlier and I, I forget, oh I made a joke, I, I said uh, occasionally, uh, hey looky there, everybody turn and wave. <laughs> That's Jeff Moss everybody, dark tangent. So you are all here today because of Jeff and so I think Jeff's going to come up and say a few words to you but the, what I, the point I was making is the, the joke was uh, as far as uh, the opening ceremonies, Jeff is an interrupt routine. So Jeff comes up and then my cycle stop and he talks. But uh, Jeff is uh, the reason that I'm here. Uh, this conference has affected my life in more ways than one and, and I'm grateful for him. So those of you this is your first time, make a lot out of the conference. But I'd, I'd like uh, everyone please give a hand to Jeff. They're good with the explanation on the bats at this point. We've okay. a little bit on waste and arms. And so, so they're all uh, they're covered in radioactive dust now. You told them about that, and then how they have to you know, decontaminate on. Okay. Good. All right. Well, thank you for coming to the con. Just have you done a show by hands? How many people are new here? Yeah. Do it again. Do it again. Oh my gosh, that's great. So, can I see? Just I'm curious, how many people are not from the United States? Holy crap! And not Canada. And, uh, <laughs> okay, now it makes more sense. <laughs> I knew I was forgetting a key part of that question. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so that's great because what we try to do every year is it would be a stagnant and the conference would end up dying if we can't bring in fresh blood. And if you think about our hacking community, at least the way it started for me, probably for you, it was really sort of an apprenticeship style program in the early days for me because there was no Amazon, there was no web, there was no security books written anywhere, um, there's no Google. So it was really about how do you get into hacking? How do you even know hacking exists? And for me it was the movie War Games um, that got me interested. Yeah, that was a good one. And so, you know, I didn't know all the problems with the movie, I just thought it was a really cool movie. And Later on in life, I, it's funny, I ended up meeting this other hacker, um, one of the next ones I met. I met him at uh, DEF CON 1. It was interesting because a speaker was speaking on stage at DEF CON 1 and like right over there, you know, we only had 100 people at the first DEF CON and he's sitting over there and he's making a little phone call on a cell phone and that right off the bat, not many people had cell phones. And uh, so I ended up talking to him and I'm like, and he's talking to me and he's been really open. And uh, he, he said, well, you know, that last speaker that was speaking, yeah, I'm in his uh, email system, so I've been reading what he's been doing, and I don't know if what he was telling you is really what he's doing. It's like, really? It's like, yeah, but I'm going to have to get into this other guy's email system and verify that. And so <clears throat> it was just like all the hackers were in everybody else's email systems. Um, and they were, anybody that was working on anything interesting, they would just sh shoulder surf and get, o get over your shoulder. Um, and so he ran a system in Seattle where he was from, which is where I was from, it was strange. He would have a bulletin board system with a big screen that said, if you find my system, let me know because I don't advertise the system. And the whole point of it was like a honey net. He was trying to find other hackers. So 
Like in war games, he just had a system, and if you dialed the city and you found his system, he wanted to meet you. And that was his way of meeting new people. And so he told me when war games came out, he was so pissed off because he was like, damn it, now my secrets are out, now people are going to lock down all these modems and everything's going to be secure. <laughs> like, oh, I wish it was that simple to fix things, you know, just release a movie. Um, so my point is that it's a, it became an apprenticeship program. I had to meet the right people. They had to meet the right people. And then we had to learn uh, from each other and be introduced to others. And so it was through this sort of web of trust where you would meet other people. Oh, that guy's a Unix guy. That's a SS7 guy. Oh, you need to talk to that guy. He knows what he's doing when it comes to, you know, Unicos or something. And so nowadays we've lost that. Right. We don't have really an apprenticeship program. This is, I'm curious. How many people here learn about hacking from a friend? How many people learned about hacking because you just started Googling it and YouTubing it? Oh, they're about the same. That's pretty surprising. So what I try to do with the conference is encourage people to meet others and to teach others because really what's the difference between that and just sitting online and reading books? So that's why I'm excited that a lot of you are first time people because I think you're going to get a lot out of it and we keep saying this, you know, the conference is what you make of it. But that's no bullshit. That's actually really true. And so anyway, that's something I want to leave you with is just think about the next generation. Think about who you're going to sort of teach or who you want to be taught by. And it's not binary, right? You can be doing two things at the same time. Um, and you're going to actually probably get more out of it teaching someone because they're going to ask you a question and you don't know the answer to it and you're going to have to go research it. And then the other cool thing is you can do projects, you can do more things. And if you look at how hacking has evolved, it's really sort of turning into a team sport. And you know, the lone contributor is, can still make big strides, but if you're thinking about how do companies work today, militaries work, defense teams work, how does any of this stuff work? It's, it's in teams. Even our puzzle challenges. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah even our puzzle challenges are team-based. So how many of you noticed that there's codes even on your lanyards, those that are first times here? So I do that uh, every year to force you to talk to each other. Because no single person can go just do the, the crypto challenge. Because you have to talk to other people, collect other pieces of information, just like out on the web. The corpus of knowledge out there to become like the ultimate elite hacker is tougher and tougher as the, the knowledge space grows. It becomes harder and harder to become an expert in all fields. So you really have to have a diversity of people on your team as far as their skill sets are concerned. And so like, uh, like DT was saying, what we really try and do is encourage you to meet and talk to each other and not to be fun and function in isolation. Even here at the conference, I've been to many security conferences where I've seen people that spend the entire time either they're in a talk listening or they're in the hallway on their laptop. And they aren't talking to anyone, they aren't interacting with anyone, they aren't making these connections. These are your, this is like your extended hacker family. This is the place you can go and wear your t-shirt and not have to explain it to somebody. Or if you do, they're interested in the explanation. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've gone through the checkout counter at a grocery store and the teller will be, will, they'll either fake laugh at my shirt because I'll have some kind of tech joke on it and I know for a fact that they didn't understand what it meant or they will look at me like I'm crazy and very rarely they'll actually ask what it means and I'll explain it to them as, as gently as I can and they do the, you know, huh. So see, his shirts are like that bulletin board from my friend. If you get his shirt, he wants to know you. <laughs> <laughs> it's your filtration device. Um, so then I'll just do a couple of like administrative things kind of around the show for first time people. There's too much show going on for you to see it all. And for me that was about DEF CON 4. When I was so pissed at first, I was so angry that more crap was happening at the conference that I could see. Like things were happening I would never know about at the conference. And it took me a while to be okay with that. <laughs> Because you want to experience everything. I wanted to see everything that was happening. And then over the years I realized, you know what we're doing with this show is we're providing, it's almost like we're, you know, conference is a platform or, or crap or something. And uh, what we're trying to do is we provide platform for people. Oh, you want to do a wall of sheep and we think you can pull it off? Guess what? I'll give you enough rope to hang yourself. You do that. And if everybody says it sucks, well, you're not coming back. But if everybody likes it, you get more rope the next year. And so 
we have this constant renewal of contests and events. And that's why you'll see some events or contests that are super polished and fantastic, and other ones that are really rough and ragged. You know the quote's going to come out now that DT is advocating bondage at DEF CON. <laughs> <laughs> I advocate bondage in general. It's probably get us in less trouble. <laughs> um, and so then with all the things that are going on, it's okay, you're not going to see everything. You know, follow Twitter, follow Facebook, follow whatever, but that's half the fun because you'll find people have radically different experiences from the same conference. And some people are night people and Vegas is per perfect for you. It's open 24-7, there's parties, music, movies, whatever. We do a lot of things really late in the night, two, three in the morning. Um, we do things sometimes pretty early in the morning. And so, you know, unless you're assisted by uh, chemical support uh, unit, you're probably not going to be up for it all. And that's cool. And so just want to let you know that we're, he we're available uh, to help give you direction and we're also available to like let you find your own way. And so that's kind of the, the videos. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, in case you don't know, you, know, you see this going on on the right. This is um, for people that might be vision impaired. But really what it, it came out of also was vision impaired Yeah. They put a question mark at the end. Drink. Vision impaired question yeah. mark. All I've got is water. I'm sorry. Um, and so it turns out, though, that for the state of California, um, a couple years ago, they, they had a law that uh, said you can't have any teaching materials in a classroom that doesn't have uh, the second audio program or doesn't have the, um, uh, what, what do they call it? Captioning. Captioning. Yes. So I wanted to have all of DEF CON in the California school system if possible and so I had to start paying for captioning. So we went out and we found a captioning company. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so because of this it turns out not only then do we get in California where it's, it's possible for any school to use the system now and be compliant with their state laws but also it means when you watch this stuff on YouTube once we finally upload it uh, and you look at the translation, it doesn't look like glip banana computer car. You know, it actually makes sense because the auto translate from YouTube doesn't work well with all of our technical lingo. Um, and the other thing we do is we, everything of course is, is available for free. We give it all away sort of back to the community. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when I started doing that at the first DEF CON, um, well, I couldn't. At the first DEFCON, we made audio tapes and we sold them. But as the internet came along, we put everything online and gave it away. And partially that was sort of a forcing function. I wanted to force other conventions to do that. I wanted to force the information to be free. And almost every conference does this. And I think that's a great, great thing. <laughs> so you can always come back and watch the videos. You can always come back and read what's going on. So if you see something that you want to do in person, you're having a great hallway conversation with someone and you're learning a lot, you know, don't worry about the talks. You can get to the talks. You can't get to those great conversations and build those relationships later. That's harder. So just think it through like what your priorities are. And there's a joke that there's, you know, two conferences. There's the hallway con and there's the speaking con. Uh, and that's true. So just kind of think what you want to get out of the, out of the conference. You know, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so to, to go further, um, and thank you, Jeff, for everybody, again, for the conference. Uh, so, so I can, I can say I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be where I am professionally be, uh, be, if it wasn't for Jeff and DEF CON because DEF CON affected my professional career. Um, but like Jeff was saying, uh, like we have things like the 1057 room. There were guys in there last night till 5, 6 o'clock this morning. That's open 24 hours. There's probably still guys there now, right? Is that what I mean? There's guys there still from last night. So um, I would encourage you, like, take a piece of one of the puzzle challenges and find someone else to work on it with you. I mean, even just if you're in line waiting for something, flip open the program, see if you can crack some of the simple ciphers. It really is a design to get you start interacting with other people. Or just get up and introduce yourself to someone else. Find somebody that's got something interesting. Go to the speakers, uh, like I was saying earlier, the speakers are approachable. Go up and talk to them afterwards. A lot of them do QA and then they go out in the hallway and they talk to people. Take advantage of that. I mean, this is one of the rare opportunities where you have to go up and directly speak to these people. And that's, that's what I did. In fact, to, to, to put the, the point on the end of the comment Jeff was making, that's how I'm here. 
I came here to my first DEF CON and competed in a contest. And then after that, I started getting involved. I went to Jeff and I said, hey, I want to do this thing. And he said, go ahead. It, and and, and <laughs> now, look, now look what's happened. So it's, it, and, and Jeff is, is, is wonderful in the fact that he will give people the opportunity to try. He'll give you the opportunity to try, but it's up to you to, to make what you will of it. So we'd like to thank you all for coming out. We welcome you to the DEF CON. I don't know if Jeff, you want to say the official DEF CON is? Yeah. DEF CON is now open. Yeah. Thank you. See you around. Thank you.